what I'll try to do is kind of walk you through uh, the energy and holistic solution uh, for breeding, and but I'm going to focus on specific subsection of that holistic solution, uh, mainly around genotyping and um, phenotype to genotype analysis, but I'll also try to uh, touch on exactly that point coming from that question about what what do we what we can offer uh, people that are trying to do breeding in uh, specific organisms which do not have everything sequenced and, and all the infrastructure ready and maybe don't have the uh, commercial value of uh, you know justifying building all the systems so energy in from day one uh, focused on trying to enable breeding uh, in many different scenarios, uh, ranging from a situation where you don't have any genomic information, you need to actually build the first reference genome for your organism, and we are practically doing that today with partners, uh, and ranging, of course, all the way to the, the example we just saw where people already have a lot of genomic uh, data, maybe so much genomic data in which they need help in big data analytics and, and integration and uh, some uh, interfaces to work better with, uh, with that kind of a data. So I'm, I'm kind of a, uh, showing now a layered approach uh, the, and the approach will later translate into a product line that uh, actually, actually answer the needs of, uh, of customers along those lines. So we start with uh, assembling a single reference genome and you've seen examples from wheat and uh, strawberry and others uh, about how energy can actually uh, assemble even very complex genomes. So that's enabling a first reference genome in many of those organisms. Uh, the next step will be to assemble several reference genome and compare them. That's a pan genome. Uh, and the next level after that is comparing a whole diversity, so a germplasm usually used for breeding, and we would actually try to scan the whole diversity and create a haplotype database. Those colored uh, pictures that we just saw are actually a graphical representation of a haplotype database, and that's exactly the outcome of uh, those efforts. Uh, and then it was like up to here it was infrastructure. Now you start using it for the application. So the, the immediate application is genotyping, which I will be showing in, in details here. And then additional to that is the correlation of phenotype to genotype, finding out the specific genomic regions that needs to, uh, that actually support a trait, and then discovering markers and b basing, um, basing your breeding decision on, on that information. So, um, the, the actually, as I explained, the, the uh, product line follows that uh, line of thought. Uh, the Novo Magic assembles genome, Pan Magic uh, creates Pan genomes, haplotypes are creating in this stage, Array Magic is our solution for genotyping, which I'll talk a lot about, and then Trait Magic is actually the solution for uh, correlating genotype to phenotype. And it all comes together in one package called Genomagic, and this is actually uh, the, the type of software that Bayer have uh, licensed. So, very quickly, Energen has assembled more than 400 genomes so far. You've seen different statistics uh, from other speakers, and this is just a, a very, uh, you know, peek into many of, uh, some uh, of our uh, assembly projects. Uh, very high quality projects, but again, Energin is not a DeNovo assembly company. I want to stress that point, and we're just using DeNovo assembly as the first step in actually orienting to breeding applications. Uh, pan magic, again, you, you take uh, multiple genomes, and you would want to fully um, compare them comparison ending up with a map between the genomes. Those maps are ex exactly the, the kind that let you move uh, marker sets from one uh, genome to the other or discover that actually uh, part of your diversity is, should be mapped to another reference genome that the one you used so far. And of course, that is used to actually identify these uh, gene space changes and ending up with uh, copy number variation, deletions, uh, translocation, and so on. But how do we actually use all this 
to un understand diversity or, and capture it in a very cost-effective manner. So uh, the, I think the basic mechanism is to first assemble each line of the diversity separately. That's a very important part because then you avoid all the problems coming from sequencing things in short reads. The assembly process will actually end with contigs and in heterozygote uh, organism or polyploid, those will be phased contigs. And this is extremely useful because now they're clean, they're long, and they're phased, and you can actually use this as a super reads to, for the next step. And, and the next step is actually taking those and aligning them to the pan genome. Again, um, capturing a lot more of the diversity out there. And then you, can, you have the basic block for starting understanding your diversity. So what happens? You have those uh, four different contigs aligning in a specific position in the pan genome, and now you're, you understand that there's like four different haplotypes, but you want to start finding markers. Now, if you just select SNPs, they will just split your uh, population into two, right? It's either this part of the SNP or this part. What you really want are dominant markers, markers that are identifying the haplotypes. And so we are actually doing this big data sequence analytic, analytics to actually identify all the different subsequences which are unique to haplotypes. Okay, it's, a, it's kind of a large scale uh, analysis because there are thousands of those, but uh, the minute you actually identify and you learn that they don't have to be SNPs, they can be any type of sequence change, okay? <coughs> Deletions, insertions, translocations, so on. And actually in maze, they are mostly non-SNPs. So 75% of the diversity and the markers that you can actually use is not a single nucleotide change. There are mainly non-SNP changes there. And if, he, if somebody is just using SNPs as a measurement of diversity, it, he's throwing away 75% of the information he could have used. And that has a very practical implication on the genotyping efficiency, which I'll just show. So, what do you do now? Now we want to use this analytics to build uh, a very efficient genotyping system. So, you, as I said, you, you're building a, a pan genome, you're building um, a haplotype, uh, I'm sorry, uh, this uh, layer of, uh, of contigs, you compare them and you find the markers. Okay, you create a haplotype database. So in this haplotype database, each haplotype blocks will be represented by many uh, sequence tags, sequence markers that are uniquely identified the haplotype. Um, how would you use this for genotyping? The nice thing about it is it's actually allowing you to use scheme sequence as your genotyping mechanism. Usually scheme sequence will be random and those reads here will not align to any SNP set, so most of the information will be wasted. But because we are actually imputing back to blocks, all we need is enough uh, sequence, sequence reads to hit enough sequence tags to call back the block. So it's a different mechanism. It's built on the fact that we have uh, pre-invested in building this haplotype database, but once it's done, now you can call the haplotypes. Now, combining this with very cost-effective library prep and with cost-effective genotype actually uh, you know, opens the gate for really cost-effective high-throughput sequence-based genotyping. So any sequence facility can now become a genotyping facility. That's a big change. So what happens if you're actually missing some of the haplotype box? So those lines here are actually containing those black areas, which means that the haplotypes are not there in the database. Again, it's just sequence data. So all you need to do is take those lines, and that's exactly on the lines of what Ruth just explained. You focus your efforts on those lines that include the most new haplotypes, and you sequence them. You add them to the database, Sorry, you add them to the database and then, oh, for, forgot, that, uh, forgot that animation, but the, it's actually, imagine that you'll put them in and this, the black areas will now be identified, okay? So, as a summary, this is an adaptable, dynamic way 
of actually understanding your diversity in the most cost-effective way. You're putting your dollars on sequencing the exact same lines that have the most new information or the most important information for you. Okay? As people here mentioned, this is uh, up, up to now, it was really a privilege for large organizations that can actually have this system set up to get to this very uh, large scale haplotypes and really our strategic customers are using this technology uh, for a while now and the, the, the uh, efficiency and cost efficiency keep improving. You know, your library prep goes down, your sequencing cost goes down, and, and the amount of sequencing and, and, and genotyping that you can do goes up. How do we actually allow the general public to use this? So this is exactly what we have tried to do in uh, this product that I'm showing now, okay? So what we have uh, identified is that if we just expose haplotype markers to uh, the general crowd, it'll be very difficult for most organizations to use it. It's, it's non-SNP or partly non-SNPs. Uh, the di density is very high, but those are non-known variants. So people don't really have pipelines to work with it right now. So what we have done is we are actually mapped very high density SNP sets to our haplotype. And we allow now translation back to SNP sets. Okay, so we impute from sequence data to haplotype, and then we translate back the SNP set, and we deliver back SNP set. Okay, and this is what I will show you now in Maze, uh, a real life example. So we've taken a real RIL population from those parental lines in Maze that we have in our database, and we basically used iGenomics library prep. iGenomics is a new, very cost-effective, uh, you know, whole genome sequencing prep uh, that just came out. We used it to prepare those libraries. And now the question is how low can we drive the sequencing coverage for each line and still get very nice uh, uh, imputation up. So we tried different uh, combinations and different coverages. Uh, we were helped a lot by uh, a nice group of collaborators. Of course, the University of Illinois is always a great help and they're a great partner. Uh, Illumina has uh, donated uh, efforts here and so on. And basically, we covered uh, the lines with, uh, with after the iGenomics library prep with sequencing coverage. And now we're trying to reduce this coverage and see how well are we doing. So we're actually measuring uh, different concentration, different coverages. So 0.01x, 0.01x coverage, 0.05 and so on. Uh, and this is uh, what we actually, uh, the, the, the percentage of the genome that is actually non-covered. And you can see this is actually, you know, the, the percentage of the genome covered, non-covered is very small. Uh, the, the, there is some errors as you go down, but again, this is breeding, okay? And we're talking millions of markers. So even if there are some minor uh, p places on the genome which are not called, the, the picture is so, so well um, represented that is way more than what uh, uh, the um, real breeding would need. So we're talking breeding scenario, B parental population, uh, those are the, the parent uh, haplotypes that are in the database for a specific segment of the chromosome. And you can actually see the imputation to the, uh, you know, to the RIL lines that are uh, in the progeny. You can see exactly where the recombination happened. You can see the uh, coverage, uh, the uh, length of the um, blocks being imputed. And you can see some of the black areas where the imputation just didn't have enough uh, resolution to call back the haplotype. So practically, and this is the next slide, we can call uh, hundreds of thousands of markers. This is back to this, the SNP set. We can impute from 0.01x coverage up to haplotype and filter back hundreds of thousands of markers for basically the cost that, as you would see, it's, it's, a, it's a under the cost of a, you know, a real microarray that you would use uh, in breeding for those uh, use cases. Okay, so for, um, instead of using a microarray that is 
actually you know a fixed set of SNPs. Usually you won't be able to allow yourself to go to a very high density uh, microarray because it's expensive. Here you get something that is not biased, is adaptive, it's dynamic, and you and you get the higher resolution uh, SNP set back. So we have uh, set up to um, announce a product, a service, which will be an end-to-end -end solution for genotyping based on that approach, and that will be for the vast crowd. So it's not going to be only focused on large-scale breeding entity, but it will be uh, open through a website to anyone who can pay for uh, sample by sample. And so uh, our customers will actually go on the website, register, send a tissue sample out to a provider. The provider will actually extract DNA, prepare the library, the iGenomics library, uh, do the sequencing, and then send the data out for Energene. Uh, Energene will analyze it and uh, send the, the VCF back to the client through that website. We can handle many clients as the, in, in this way. Uh, the SLA should be very similar to genotyping uh, SLAs now, so it's around eight weeks. And basically, the whole thing would be streamlined and cover um, you know, more and more organisms as we go. So, why, why should people uh, choose to, to do that? Uh, just as an example, uh, you would go on a maze example and you would get more than 600,000 markers, okay? And you would see the, the pricing later on, uh, and uh, 200,000 markers in soy, okay? Uh, you would see uh, the actual, you know, Basically, this is a part of a holistic solution, right? This is just a chunk of what energy can offer, but it's a very useful chunk. But the, the other parts are there, so if people want to continue on working with energy for, uh, you know, for example, QTN analysis or other applications, this is a great uh, way to start. Um, and then, basically, it's all sequencing. And as we go forward, the, the price will keep dropping as Illumina, for example, is just going further and further into trying to get to those $100 human genome. We will all be benefiting from that. Um, so what's, how can I approach it? You know, what's in it for me? So uh, during PAG, we have a special offer. We have a website up. You can ask uh, the uh, sales guys around the room. Uh, you can go on. Uh, we're specifically uh, allowing very small volumes in this stage because we want people to try us out. So we, can, we would even accept 96 samples projects, which we we'll probably won't do in, in the future. But we want people to go on there, you know, send us, sam send us uh, samples and compare the outcome with what would they got if they use a real microarray. Okay, so it's a straight apples to apple comparison. You can compare the outcome. This is exactly what you should have been gotten with the microarray, and there's no question about the quality or the usability of the outcome. Uh, specifically, there'll be an, a specific offer for the first uh, 20 customers that uh, will actually um, re register and, and, and set the project, so uh, we will hope that you all go on and try it out. Uh, but again, we are looking for customers that will do breeding in the future. So hopefully uh, that offer will drive you to try us out small, but then uh, uh, you know, go for a larger, um, larger project, and then you would actually be uh, compensated for, this little, for the small trial, and you'll get um, you know, credit into your larger, uh, larger project. So just to summarize, uh, go, taking this uh, sequenced-based haplotype imputation approach into the large scales, uh, Energene is now offering to do that immediately in uh, soy and maize. Uh, cotton, canola, tomatoes will be coming up very soon and other uh, organisms will follow. Farm animals, aquaculture. Okay. What can you do after genotyping? So actually, uh, the nice thing about uh, the database, the haplotype database, it allows you to uh, use the blocks to do more than just imputation. Basically, the 
a very straightforward uh, um, usage of that is to correlate haplotype blocks uh, distribution with phenotypic distribution. So you can actually send energy in your genotypic information and phenotypic information, and energy can correlate that, ending up with haplotype blocks that are, you know, under uh, you know pushing the trait or, or re uh, responsible for the trait. So that will actually allow people to do uh, haplotype-based QTL mapping without having any system. Okay, the uh, in in those organisms where energy has already built a haplotype database, people can just use the same haplotype database to analyze their uh, genotyping information without building their own. And in soy, for example, uh, we believe that our current uh, database covers so much of the diversity that most of the breeding entities will not need to add anything. Okay? Um, so practically, uh, it will actually be uh, sending us parental lines, uh, sending us the progeny. Uh, we will build a genetic map, which is also part of the uh, outcome in this case. And this genetic map will be very dense because it's, again, built on sequence. And then the outcome of the whole QTL analysis will be the specific haplotype that is, you know, uh, supporting the, the trait and the markers that differentiate that haplotype from all the other haplotypes in the block. So there's not just SNPs. Again, the, what energy will deliver are dominant markers. The markers that should dif differentiate in any of the populations that are represented in the database. So basically, the, it's, it's a nice add-on, but energy is now releasing to the public domain, to open source, the visualization system that actually allows you to visualize the pan genome and the haplotype uh, based uh, uh, trait uh, analysis. So at the end of uh, a project, uh, Energin will deliver the, the text information that's underlying this picture. This picture is actually showing you the distribution of the haplotypes versus the correlation to the trait. Okay, this is maze information. Uh, and that open source is immediately accessible. Anyone that goes on the website registered can download the code to, to his computer. It's a Java code, should be running no problem. And then people can start doing the service and visualizing the results on their own computers. Just as an example, uh, this is uh, the, the same population here is a CML by B73 in maze. Uh, population for um, southern uh, leaf blight, uh, and you can actually see that the region in uh, in a specific uh, region of, of the genome, which is correlated with the trait, actually have genes. But the main changes in the in the actual genomes are the difference between the genomes actually up upstream from the genes, actually a promoter change. So in many of the cases you never see this information because you don't, you don't have enough genomic information to see the difference between the genomes outside of the genes. So this is basically the message. Energene is supporting a holistic solution for breeding. We are now supporting it for any entity of any size, any organism. And uh, the first, this is the first step of actually uh, enabling much larger part of the breeding community to use uh, sequence-based genotyping and uh, haplotype-based, uh, uh, you know, analysis to streamline exactly those, uh, uh, you know, cases where it's difficult for the breeding entity to set up a very large, complicated, and expensive genomic infrastructure to do this. Thank you very much.